Agents Podcast. Life is noisy. You open up social media apps, you turn on television, which a lot of us don't even do that anymore. Uh, you, you open up your laptop, you really anywhere you go, there is more messages being thrown at us, more content, more people with microphones, more people on, on virtual stages. And damn, it's hard to kind of navigate and swim through that noise. And our guest today wrote a book about this. The title of the book is called Static. What an appropriate name. He is a friend of mine. He's a friend of Lab Code Agents. He's he's a part of Lab Code Agents. His name is Alex Rivlin. Many of you know him. He and I met at uh, Closing Table Mastermind a number of years ago and I've stayed in touch ever since. And dude, I am really excited when I heard about this book and when Tristan said, let's do this podcast. Um, honestly, we haven't talked in a while. So I'm excited yeah. to do this just for that purpose. But this book... Like this topic is so relevant today and, and so many agents and just humans struggle with this. Uh, I'm excited to talk about this. But before we get into that, Alex, uh, let's start with the basics. Who the hell are you? I know people have seen you in lab coats, but, uh, you know, kind of what what's your background? What's your story? and What led you to where you are today? Sure. So, uh, thanks so much, Jeff, for, uh, for having me on and de definitely appreciate and love the lab coat community. Uh, and so who I am right now, I, I, I operate a team in real estate, uh, but I've been an entrepreneur uh, since a young age. Uh, I worked since I was 10 years old, uh, born and raised in New York, right outside of the city. Now I reside in Las Vegas uh, with my girlfriend and two beautiful children. And, uh, and at 18, I started my first business and it was in auto repair. And, uh, you know, most people wonder how I kept my hands so clean, but I, I did. And uh, I was a mechanic for years and decided to open up my own shop. And uh, so at 18, I got into auto repair, uh, exited that business at about 26 years old, got into insurance, which I refer to uh, as Alex 2.0. Uh, then I spun the my insurance company off into a technology company still within the insurance field. And that was that was my biggest claim to fame in regards to the size of the business. I grew up from an idea that I had, brought in a co-founder, and grew to 165 employees within three years. Um, when I was exiting that business, I was looking at what I was going to do next. And I always feel like what I want to do is, A, I want to solve a problem, and B, I want to help as many people as possible. Now, you might think, well, okay, so people are buying houses and selling houses. That's how you want to help as many people as possible, right? And that's not actually the case. Uh, the reason that I got into real estate was that I saw so many people with rose-colored glasses getting into the business on the real uh, on the realtor or real estate agent side and quickly exiting. Uh, the stats in Las Vegas alone are worse than the rest of the nation, uh, but not by much. But it was 82% of people that were getting their license didn't renew it in the second year. And when I looked at that, I just thought for a moment, why are they doing that? I'm sure that if I go and survey 100 people, none of them are going to say, well, I love dabbling in things, six to eight months max at, at each thing. And so you probably won't see me next year. The majority, if not all of them, are going to say, this is what I'm going to do with the career. And then all of a sudden, it doesn't happen. Yeah. And when the dues are, you know, <laughs> are required for renewal, they ended up jumping out of it uh, instead of paying their dues. And I knew I could impact some of those. Now, I can't impact all of them. I figured out of the 82, 70 of them, I actually wouldn't be able to help. Why? They don't have the grit. They don't have the wherewithal. They're not willing to do the work that it takes to succeed. 12 of them, however, will. They're willing to do all the work. They're willing to grind it out. It's like the person that goes to the gym and gets there faithfully at 5 a.m. and sets an hour and a half every day of the week to do it. They don't know how to properly use the equipment. They don't know the proper form. And they're and after a year, they're looking at it and they haven't lost the weight or built the physique that they want, but it's because they hadn't gotten the right guidance. So I knew that that was something that I could affect with the companies that I've done previously. So Alex 4.0 was born into the real estate industry and I started building a team right away. That's awesome. And and so and so you, like you say, you you how long have you been in real estate? Did you mention how how long that, that's been? Uh six years. Six years. Okay, so you haven't even, you haven't even been in it long. What what was the inspiration to to kind of move you over to to this to this side of of the world? Well, again, it was really that uh, 
that I was exiting one business and I was looking at what I was going to do next and how I could help as many people as possible. And the, uh, the reality of it is I actually was looking at getting into development and developing a real niche product in housing. And I said, in order to do that, I really need to understand more about real estate markets, market trends, uh, what buyers are looking at, what sellers are looking at. So let me get into the real estate side of things and just start to really analyze that. But what happened was, as I started researching it, before I got a license or did anything, when I started researching the real estate side of the industry, that's when I discovered uh, this attrition rate. And uh, it was atrocious, as you know. And when I saw that, I said, forget the development side. I can make more of an impact here. I can help people succeed in the career when they wouldn't have, or help people that are succeeding in the career succeed at an even higher level. Uh, either whether that's making more money, because uh, success has obviously different different definitions for everybody. So whether that's making more money or getting a better, uh, as Tristan loves to call it, and, and I did a, uh, it's funny, a few years ago, I, I did a video on Lab Code Agents about words matter, and, and I, I do the same thing as Tristan. I don't call it balance, I call it harmony. Um, so whether it's better harmony in their life, uh, whether it's more time for vacations, whether it's building passive income streams by uh, buying properties or or investing in other companies. Or, you know, right now uh, I own some portion of five different companies. So if I can show people these different paths and help them succeed, again, whether it's financially, whether that's more time with their family, um, you know, it's a mentor to others, uh, you know, going down the path of their dream you know, what they want to do with their life, then, uh, then I feel like I've succeeded. So the more people I help, the happier I am. And as a result of it, I get compensated well, right? right. But that's the, that, that's the last part I look at. The, the parts that I look at are, how can I live my purpose? How can I help as many people as possible along the way? And if I'm doing all those things right, the money comes. Yeah, like, I, I never have to focus on the money. I never have to say, this is the amount of money I want. What do I have to do to get that? Mm -hmm. I, I look at what I have, what I want to do, what I desire to do, what my purpose is, and then the money comes as a result of that. Mm -hmm. So it all works out. Well, and let's be honest. Most real estate agents get into this industry uh, because they are sick of the lack of control over their career uh, in many cases, or they see the, the opportunity to not to have control, but that control also usually yields shitty results because they don't have the discipline. And so, I mean, I, I don't care what any real estate agent says. I've been around this business 22 years and, and it's the same in mortgage. And let's be honest, the, the ability to make the amount of money that we can make with controlling our schedules is the best. There's no other industry like it. And, and the barrier to entry is relatively easy comparably to being an attorney or a doctor, or, you know, so many other fields. I love what you said, because uh, to me, Alex, balance is a cliche word that is a bunch of garbage. Um, and 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 I harmony is the right word. I love that you said that, because if you really want to be successful, and again, most of you get into this business to make probably more than you made at your last job, right? And so, and for most, you want to get into that six-figure number for some at seven, right? Uh, balance is not doesn't go hand in hand with success. I'm sorry, it doesn't. Uh, what's what's critical is balancing the struggle of how many hours you're going to have to work, the 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 things that you're going to have to give up in order to to achieve those levels. Which is why I love that you said harmony. Let's talk about that for a minute because I think a lot of people listening to this truly believe in that fantasy world. I'm going to have balance. I'm going to make 250 grand a year and 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 work from nine to five and spend three hours with my children. And, and I'm going to do all this bullshit. It's, it doesn't happen. Right. And so what's your what's your opinion on my harsh opinion on that topic? No, I, I think you're spot on. Uh, so, again, I've, I've used the word harmony now for probably around six or seven years. Um because balance just seemed like this elusive thing. And, and when you have these elusive things, whether it's, a, whether it's a dollar amount, whether it's how you believe you should be living your life, uh, what happens is it creates this, uh, 
what, what's the right way to say it, this, you're always reaching for happiness or fulfillment and you rarely ever achieve it, right? Because it's always, once I get to this, I'll be happy. Well, one of two things happens. Either you never get to it, so you live in discouragement and disappointment, or when you get to it, it's a little anticlimactic, and then you set a new goalpost, right? Sean Acor uh, did an amazing TED Talk uh, on, on happiness, and he talked about that, right? Oh, you know what? When I reach this level in my career, I'll be happy. And then you reach that level in your career, and you're like, man, I want more, right? When I make 100,000, I'll be happy. Yeah. Okay, I'm making 100,000. Okay, you know what? It, it, it's, it's not as easy going as I thought it would be. I thought I'd have be putting a bunch of money in the bank, everything else. You know what? I need to make 250. Then I'll really be happy. And then you get to 250. And ah, you know what? This isn't doing it either. Why? Well, because you bought a bigger house and you have a bigger car and you're going on nicer vacations and you're still not saving the money you thought. So it's got to be 500 now. And you know that when you're chasing happiness, that was the word I was looking for. When you're chasing happiness, it's an issue. So har harmony versus balance is the same thing. So uh, when I really grasp this concept in my life, what I realized is that there are going to be times that maybe I only get to spend 30 minutes with my kids, right? However, where it's harmony is simply that that 30 minutes is the most concentrated, focused, meaningful 30 minutes I can make it. Mm -hmm. That means the phone is off or if it's on and it buzzes in my pocket, it stays on and I just get to enjoy the, the, the thigh jiggle, right? Um, that's, that's it though. I am there and I am focused. So, uh, you know, I, I, I've never read the book all the way through and I probably should, but I've definitely gotten a lot of pieces of it. But Eckhart Tolle, The Power of Now, really being present, not thinking about what's going to happen tomorrow or what happened to you earlier today that's still, you know, bothering you. Uh, it's really, I'm here right now and I'm hanging out with Jeff Fitzer and this is great and I have an amazing amount of gratitude for it. And that this is where I am. And this is the only place that I am. I'm not somewhere else in my head in the past or the future. I'm here because this is the only place I can be. And that to me is harmony. And when I, when I told people the story and I remember again, when I did my words matter series on lab code uh, and I did balance versus harmony, I used the analogy of a barbershop quartet. And I said, if you've ever listened to a barbershop quartet, there are times when it's just the tenor singing. And then all of a sudden the bass comes in and the bass isn't really singing. The volume isn't as loud as the tenor, right? They're just in the background going boom, 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 boom. And they might ha not have as much time in the song. They might not have as much volume in the song, but together the alto, the tenor, the, the baritone, they sound absolutely amazing. And it would be missing something if any of those parts were missing even though they're not there through the whole song. So there's not balance. They're not getting equal time. They're not getting equal volume. They're not getting equal attention. However, together, it's amazing. So that 30 minutes with my son or daughter versus the 10 hours I work versus three hours that I'm doing chores and taking care of things, it all works in harmony. Yeah, I, lo I love that. And, and, and the reality too is, is you just, you know, so you just mentioned 30 minutes. And then every, every time I, I, I have this conversation, because I've had this conversation, because I'm a notorious uh, work junkie, content creation junkie, but equally a family junkie, right? And so uh, people always say, how do you do it? But but that's the thing is this, I feel like society creates our narratives. And we assume that the right thing to do in quotations is stop working at a certain time and spend several hours. Who said that was the right thing to do? I mean, who's to say that you displaying a powerful work ethic to your children is not having a more profound of impact on their future than you being half present? Because my wife and I've talked about this a million times over the years. She's, you know, because it's like, I'm not the dad that, that was at 4.30 out in the yard playing catch with the son kind of thing. Uh, but I made it a priority to take the son to the ball game, right? Because it's just something that we would have in common, but I didn't have time for that. And I don't know. I mean, I guess maybe you have to make your own, uh, maybe some will say I'm making my own apologies in my head, but at the same token, 
I don't know, man. I I think about it and I think about my life and how it's progressed and how how the world has evolved. And even though I you might say you're present because you're not working, are you really present? And and you know, it's it's um I don't know. I love I love how you said that. And I think a lot of people need to stop and think about that because as it relates to this conversation about static and now harmony versus balance. I think so many of you beat yourselves up and, you know, this industry is very female dominated. And so women and mothers beat themselves up more than dads. Let's just cut, let's cut to the chase, right? It's just the way we are genetically designed. And so I think as a woman listening to this, understand and realize where your narrative came from. Who told you that you needed to have this, do this or do that? Where'd that come from? Create your own. And 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 be proud of it and 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 own it. And um, I don't know, Alex. I, I I'm not a psychiatrist or therapist or anything of the like. But I, you know, I've gone through these own conversations in my head over the last twenty years, and we're all just trying to be the best we can be, right? For sure. And I mean that that's a great segue into static and and kind of what the book is about, because you know you said a couple of key things there. Who told you? this right so we're even saying something right now however what we're saying right now what works for me what works for jeff might not be what works for everybody and and actually won't be what works for everybody it might not if if there's a thousand people or a hundred thousand people that watch this listen to this there might not be a single person that what i'm doing actually works for or what you're doing actually works for it might be close but it's like a fingerprint. There's fingerprints that there's a lot of things that match on the fingerprint, but not everything. So it wasn't me, uh, you know, but uh, when it comes down to it, it, it's a matter of forging your own path and understanding that we have all taken in. Uh, and, and I still, I wrote the book and, I'm, and I still practice it and fight it every day, so to speak. Uh, but we've all taken in certain elements of who we are and what our programming is based on everything from our experiences, our parents, uh, you know, our environment and society. And we set these expectations onto ourselves. And those expectations are expectations that came as a result of society, right? Because the expectations are clearly a lot different in the Amish community in Dutch Pennsylvania than they are in, in where we are, right? Sin City. They, they yeah, they work. Yeah, they work. <laughs> they work at a younger age, plowing the fields. Um, electricity and 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 cell phones and computers uh, are are non-existent. Uh, you know, and and you see it through different cultures. I'm just using one more extreme culture because we, you know, we probably look at them and, and you know we may admire them in certain cases, but we probably most of us probably think, wow, in this day and age, how do they live like that? And they're probably looking at it, us and saying, wow, how distorted is your reality? Yeah. You live like that, right? So uh, it, it really does become kind of part of it. So, uh, so yeah. Well, it's, it's, uh, so let's, let's get over to the static because, uh, you know, based on that, based on that conversation, which is, you know, how, how is, how has your narrative been written? And from, you know, you and I come from the same generation. So generationally, it was following in our parents footsteps ultimately you know it's the people that that we grew up around maybe it's aunt and uncles maybe it's siblings uh, maybe it's grandparents but now that's completely changing and and now the narratives of how we are designing our, or 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 thinking that we need to live our lives is revolved around what we're seeing these highlight reels of people's lives on social media and and you know you know I talk about this all the time when I'm talking about social because you know, for so many people, they hate it and despise it because it has arguably had a massive negative impact on humans and, and especially young females more than anything. Right. And so um, this is a this is a topic that I, I don't know where this is going to go, because um, <laughs> here I am, the one who's living inside of that I live in static every day. Now I love it. I embrace it for the right, for different reasons, because it works for my business. But a lot of people struggle with that because they go down these rabbit holes and it just consumes them. And so tell us a little bit about this book and let's talk, let's talk tactical, tangible things that, that I think maybe people mentally struggle with. 
Sure, and, and you certainly hit on several things that I've written about in the book. Uh, like, for instance, we all have, uh, not we all, many of us have comparison syndrome. And, uh, you know, it started back in uh, as, a, as a cartoon or, I'm sorry, a comic strip back in, I think it was like 1913, called Keeping Up with the Joneses, right? The difference was then we only got a glimpse of people's lives. Now we're getting a much larger portion of their lives through social media. However, most of the people that are posting on social media are, are posting their highlight reel, right? They're not posting. I mean, you see some emo uh, people where they're, where they're showing something or they're, uh, you know, they're talking about everything that's bad in their life. For the most part, though, people are only talking about what's good in their life. And then what we do is we have this, this kind of, uh, you know, really unfair pressure that we put on ourselves because what we're doing is we're comparing their highlight reel with our behind the scenes. And it's not the same. Our highlight reel might look as good or better. It just depends on how good we are at editing our life. Uh, however, we're not seeing our behind the scenes. And uh, there's a story in the book about a very close friend of mine. And everybody wanted his life, uh, except for I didn't, because I knew how actually miserable he was. And it was sad. I mean, he, you know, he had a beautiful and, and great wife. They just weren't compatible. And, uh, and, and he was living in misery. But his Facebook did not show that. And I literally had people come up to me saying, hey, you know him, right? You're his friend. Wow. You know, like, what a lucky guy. Look at the life he has. And all I thought was, no, not, not really. So well, you, well, you, you think about people like Robin Williams or the dancer that just that just committed suicide. Like when you when you see social like like that guy, I can't think of his name, but I've seen him on social. He's a, you know, and he was it, it, I love his content. It makes you feel good. It was uplifting. It was fun dancing. He was a great dancer. And then little did we know. He, he was had some massive struggles to the point that it caused him to take his own life. And it's like. Yeah. 40 years yeah. old or something, right? Or it's crazy. Yeah. 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 Which, which I think you're talking about, right? Yeah. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. So, so Jeff, I'll, I'll kind of take you back to, uh, to kind of a story um, through where I went through this discovery. Uh, Cause it, cause it dates back now, you know, probably pretty close to when I started the, the real estate career. And, uh, but, but I'm going to take you back because a lot of it really starts from childhood. And just like you, I'm not a psychologist, I'm not a psychiatrist. So this is just through observations, reading. So this is a lay person, uh, you know, kind of talking to other people from a perspective that that's not clinical, that's not education based other than self-education. So, um, so it really started back in, uh, in, in fifth grade for me. Uh, I'm on the bus to school heading in for the day. And just like any other bus ride, you know, kids are hooting and hollering, screaming. And we pulled up to the next stop to pick up more kids. And I looked out the window and there she was. It, it was the new girl. Never saw this before. And for me, all of the screaming turned to absolute silence. I was just, I was mesmerized. I mean, she seriously was the most beautiful girl in the world that I had ever seen. And in that moment, I, it just struck me. And I was like, Jeff, what kind of guy would this girl like? Am I that type of guy? Could I be that type of guy? And then like this, this overwhelming thought and really insecurity came over me of, wait a second, who actually am I? Because I wasn't the jock, right? My friend Brian and, and my other friend Timmy, they were the jocks. Um, I wasn't really like the cool kid, but I wasn't a geek. Um, you know, I was smart. I excelled at school, but you know, no broken glasses and pocket protector, so to speak. Um, so I didn't even know who I was. So I thought, how can I expect her to know who I am or notice me or better like me? Um, so I kind of started to hide and um, I didn't even know if she knew I existed. And, uh, you know, it's kind of where it all began. So like many people, I, I had serious feelings of self-doubt, uh, feeling like I needed to fit in and was wondering how would I be accepted, loved or looked at as cool. And worse off, how could I even stop thinking about it and worrying? Because I was spending so much time worrying about it that I wasn't actually focusing on how to, how to figure this out. So 30 years later, uh, I realized I'd actually been living a lie. So now I'm 39 years old and I felt just like that 10 year old boy. And I was actually being who I thought everyone else 
who I thought the world or society had expected me to be. And the noise from people's advice to mass media, marketing, social media, and society, society as a whole was influencing my decisions and detouring me from my true path and you know, my true self. So over the next five years, I went through some deep soul searching, got my hands on tons of books um, and hired some coaches. Um, you know, I met you in a mastermind. I mean, that wasn't a, a, a personality or the kind of self-doubt type coach coaching, but there was still elements of that in there, right? You know, I remember uh, remember a couple different people like uh, Adam Lyons and um, I'm drawing the blank on the other person's name. Uh, he had a book that he gave me uh, called Higher Status. Um, and, you know, like, so through all those things, um, you know, spent a bunch of money doing it. And I returned to my core and I found my identity. And the cool part, Jeff, was that I fell in love with it. And I fell in love with me, who I am. And uh, so it was really, a, you know, an experience for me that brought me to a point where I no longer had to have self-doubt because I knew who I was. And it's a pretty wild thing because not only did I know who I, you know, do I know who I am now? I own every part of it. So it's it's interesting. I'm sure you've heard of uh, neuroscience or neurolinguistic programming, right? And it's not just about talking to others. It's also about what we say to ourselves. So I've got a really good friend, Jennifer, and she's really, really into it. She follows Joe Dispenza and a few other people. And I, and I, and I love the stuff. I, I love it there. Uh, I love studying that as well. But she said something to me once, and I disagree with it. And here's why I disagree with it, because it's all it's, it's all perspective, right? It's the six to one half dozen of the other. And what happened was I was at an event in San Diego and I was talking to a group of people and I don't remember how it came up, but something came up. I think it's because we were on this property with all these amenities and something came up about basketball. And I said, I'll play, but I am absolutely terrible at basketball. And she kind of like, she was standing right next to me. She kind of backed up a little bit and put her, put her mouth close to my ear and said, don't say that. And I was like, don't say what? She goes, don't say you're terrible at something. That's, that's negative self-talk. Say that's an area for improvement. Now, I disagree with that. And here's why. I own that I'm terrible at basketball. It is part of me. I'm terrible at basketball. The reason that I don't want to say it's an area for improvement is I have zero intention to spend any time improving it. So it's not an area for improvement. So if I was worried about how awful I was at basketball, that's self-doubt. That's me thinking the world expects something better of me. They go, hey, wait, you're six foot tall, you're thin, you're fit, you should be better. Says who? I own who I am in its entirety. So there are areas that I feel like I'm very good and I excel and I've, I gained mastery and I can teach others. There are areas that I can absolutely use improvement and I'm committed to improving. And there are areas that I'm terrible and I have no desire to improve, but I know each of those. And as a result of that, I don't have to have self-doubt anymore, right? Because I know exactly who I am. So what the world expects of me is irrelevant because I'm okay being terrible at basketball and the things that I do need to improve, I know I need to improve. So if there, if, if the world is looking at me saying he could be better at that, yeah, I know it too. And I'm going to work on it, but I don't need to have self-doubt because I'm working on it. So that's really the crux of it. So I don't have to really listen to the static as a result of that. Now, like I said, it's an everyday practice. I still find myself being manipulated by television commercials or, or social media commercials. Uh, so I have to quiet that static daily. There, there's no light switch for this. There's no, hey, read my book and you're going to be static free for the rest of your life. That's not the case at all. It's the practices that we do daily, just like going to the gym. If you, you know, you can't get fit once and stay fit forever. Mm -hmm. You got to keep doing it. So what do you say though? Because and 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 um, you know, as as it relates to this topic, obviously you've found harmony. You've found a way to to navigate through this. And I'll give an example. Uh, so one of the things that I I tell audiences when I'm speaking or teaching is that 
uh, for example, because social media, obviously, when it comes to static, I think is by far the biggest driver of the static in our world nowadays, and and the driver to 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 what we think we should be, right, or or to beating ourselves up, and and when it, as as it relates to let's just say social media experts. Uh, over the last two or three years, there the world has been inundated with social media experts, and I'm putting that in quotations for those of you not watching. And the reason I do that is because the way I look at it is, is you have to really look a little bit deeper at, at who you're watching to see if they really are an expert or to see if what it is that they're putting out is actual reality in in order to not let it beat yourself up. And so as it relates to social media, quote unquote experts, I always tell people like, you can't go to a conference anymore, especially in the real estate world. And, and they're not going to have at least one speaker talking about social media strategies. Sure. But I always tell people like, before you run out of there and determine that you should do what they tell you to do, go stalk them and see if they do it. Because, if, because most don't. Most just are eloquent and are regurgitating what Gary V says or what us at Drunk on Social say. And, and so one of the things where I, I say, and Tristan and I put ourselves on pedestals or, 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 or would pat ourselves on the back is saying, we're not just a bunch of voices, we're practitioners. And anything that we tell you to do or we show you is because we tried it first. And mm -hmm. now it works. And we're going to tell you why it works or why it doesn't work. And and I, and I think when it comes to this static and when it comes to all of the things that you be, feel like your life should be, how do you, you know, so for that, it's easy. Go stalk them, see if they actually practice what they preach. But if, if you know, when it comes to the aesthetics of people's lives and, you know, I mean, Alex, you probably have friends just like I do, married couples that my wife and I are very close to. We know the intimate relationship and how e each other is bitching about each other all the time, and they really are not in harmony at all. But every time I see them on social, I think they're living under a rainbow. Mm -hmm. um, how do you navigate that? How do you swim through that and not let it impact you and make you look at your marriage and say, we suck? Yeah, so it's, it's, it's an interesting question, and it's surface level and deep at the same time. Uh, so the way that I went through uh, kind of my self-discovery and what I do now, uh, it, it was it was a difficult transition for me. And one of the biggest reasons, and this will apply to you know probably 30 or 40 percent of the people in the audience, is that I'm a very impulsive decision maker. Um, while I'm analytical because I'm really good with numbers, my disk does not show that I'm analytical at all. It's like it's super low because I'm really impulsive. Now I might figure something out in my head really quickly and do some math really quickly to lead me to say yes to that decision. Uh, however, I did not go through a, a deep analysis of it. It's just a surface level for me. So being impulsive uh, and quiet and static, I think is, is, is a more difficult scenario because you hear something, you uh, somebody gives you advice, somebody advertises something to you and you just want to go to action. So the way that I've really done it more than anything else is I ask myself three questions and I can still make an impulsive decision. Um, I could have this decision made to, to go all in on a marketing program within two minutes. Uh, but I still ask myself these questions first. And the questions I ask myself are, am I doing this for myself or am I doing this for somebody else? And then if I am doing this, for myself? Am I indirectly doing this for somebody else? So, and I'll, I'll go deeper into that. And then the third question is, will this put me ahead on the path of my life that I believe I'm going down? You know, so it's like rolling the dice in Monopoly, you know, is this going to actually move me forward a certain number of steps? Um, or is this just going to be a detour, a setback, you know, so somebody hypothetically thinking about buying a new car for themselves. Now, is that going to move them forward? Is that going to set them back? Were they between two decisions of maybe spending a little more money on a family vacation to, to really deepen their family bond uh, or buy the car or marketing in their business? so that they can make more money 
or buy the car, or maybe buying a property to create passive income or buying the car, right? Now, look, I, I own two cars. One of them's an exotic. It's, you know, it's, I, I spend money on cars. So this is not to say, don't go buy the car. However, if it was between those, what is best for you right now? Buying the car is the best thing for you. And that's going to move you ahead. Great. Right. And maybe it will. Right. I bought my fancier car because I didn't want to join the country club. And I don't live in the, in the multi-million dollar communities that I actually wanted to start making an impact on. So buying the car gave me the ability to get into that luxury community. So it did move me ahead. However, that said, I did wait a while to buy the car and I actually created some other passive income opportunities. So, it, so the car actually doesn't cost me anything because I did the other things first. So there, there's all these thoughts around that, right? Now, in those first two questions, um, you know, am I doing this for myself or am I doing this for somebody else? That one's pretty simple. You know, there are times, and when I say doing it for somebody else, I don't mean like, hey, Jeff, it turns out that you bought a new house and you're moving this weekend and you need help moving. Am I doing that for you? Yes, I'm doing that for you. But that's also for me because that's, that, that's showing what a friend I am. That makes me feel good about myself. So when I'm talking about, am I doing it for me or am I doing it for somebody else? I don't mean charitable or giving or giving of time. Um, I mean more of that decision. Did I buy this jacket because I like it and it's for me? Or did I buy it because some girl told me, hey, I think that would look good on you? right? Because if, if that was the case, then I'm buying it for her, mm -hmm. not for me, right? Then the second question is, if I am doing it for myself, am I indirectly doing it for somebody else? So I'll use the jacket as another example, right? Um, nobody told me to buy it. I looked at it and I thought, ah, oh, that's a nice jacket. I really like that pattern. But I'm more of a jeans and t-shirt kind of guy. So why am I buying this jacket? Well, it's to impress others. It's to make them think that, oh, this guy's serious and he's refined and he's debonair or, you know, whatever things. So that's me doing it for me. Nobody else told me to do it. Nobody else gave me advice to do it. However, I am indirectly doing it for somebody else. That may, be, that may come by way of the static of marketing, right? Because there's some advertisement for uh, whatever jacket company this is. And when they're, when they're advertising, you know, Calvin Klein or Armani or Hugo Boss or whoever else, guess what's right next to the guy once they put that jacket on? Oh, that really beautiful girl, right? And then, you know, he steps over to his Aston Martin to get in. And then, you know- That's in front of a castle. Yeah, exactly, right? So, so now I'm doing it because, wait, I, I, if, if I look the part, then that means it, right? One of my least favorite- uh, statements, and we hear it a lot in real estate, uh, is fake it till you make it. I think everybody should throw that statement to the trash. Don't fake it till you make it. Be authentic. Be who you are. If you don't know something, admit you don't know it. But know that you can go and, and get that information, right? Uh, most of us have probably heard of or possibly seen the movie or read something about uh, a person by the name of Aaron Brockovich. As a matter of fact, uh, one of the Lab Code Agent Live events a few years ago, Aaron Brockovich was the keynote speaker, if I remember correctly. Yeah. So Aaron Brockovich uh, fought a company, I believe the company was called PG&E, uh, regarding contaminating water. And I think the effects of it were, uh, it's been a long time since I've uh, seen the movie, so people could correct me if I'm wrong, but it was, it was kids were getting sick in, in the neighborhood. I think it was leukemia, um, but whatever it was, there, there was a massive scenario there. Um, where where people were getting sick, and it was clearly a result of of bad practices on this company, and uh, and what I would posit is that whoever brought this to the plethora of attorneys to which Aaron Brockovich decided to take the case, you know, when when Aaron looked at it, she didn't say, "I'm an expert in disease." I have my doctorate in, in, you know, my medical doctorate. Um, I know about watershed. I know about the chemical compositions of the contaminants that they're putting in the water. Um, I know how a human body reacts to those contaminants. She didn't know any of that. 
but she had certainty, not even confidence. She had certainty. And the certainty that she had was that I will work harder for these people than anyone else will, or, you know, equal to, or harder than anyone else. And all of the resources that I need are out there. And I have the aptitude and ability to find them, whether that means an expert witness, whether that means information on the internet or prior case studies, or, uh, you know, I go and scoop up a shovel full of the dirt next to that water and send it off to a lab. Like all of the resources are out there. So you don't need to fake it till you make it. Aaron Brockovich never said, oh, this is a perfect case for me. I'm an expert in every single thing you just said. Childhood disease, watershed, that, 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 right? No, she didn't have to do that. So that's where I think fake it till you make it is terrible. But again, we put this pressure on ourselves because we believe that's what other people expect. Yeah. So really cool thing to make you think deep here, Jeff, is uh, there's a guy by the name of Charles Cooley. I don't know if you ever heard of him, but he's an American uh, sociologist. And in 1903, he said something that's now been put into a quote. And it's, and it's really deep. And I love it. it the, this one was, had such a profound impact and meaning to me. And his quote was, I am not who I think I am. I am not who you think I am. I am who I think you think I am. Now, yeah, I know. Yeah, it's like you shake your head there. Um, so it, I'll break it down because, yeah, it is one of those deep things. My self-identity, uh, most people's, now mine with, 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 with static or without static is, is pretty solid. That is actually very solid, very certain. Um, most people's self-identity and my self-identity prior to six years ago was what I believed you thought of me or somebody else thought of me or the world thought of me. So I might think, you know, let's say you're a, a fairly non-emotive person and you, you know, you're, you're a little more stoic, right? So now my belief is, I don't know, Jeff never really opens up to me. So I, I don't think he likes me. I don't think he thinks I'm cool. So now that's my image of myself. You may think I'm the coolest dude in the world. And, and I think that, right? You know, because I'm putting that, that self-static, that own, you know, the self-induced noise, just because I can't read your body language because I don't vibe with you at that level. But it's not necessarily what you think of me. So people that think that, they're not attractive, they're not smart enough, they're not, you know, they're doing it because they believe that's what people think of them. And maybe somebody teased them at one point, ridiculed them, said something, but they said it, they didn't mean it the way they said it, they were just joking. Or again, maybe one person said that, maybe that one person really does believe that, and they were being very candid. Doesn't mean everybody else believes it. So you don't have to put that on yourself because of that one person, right? Um, you know, somebody that drives trucks all the time and absolutely loves them and, and wants their, you know, their big Ford F-350 lifted truck and that's all they would drive doesn't mean they don't like, you know, a, a sports car, you know, whether high end or, or you know, average, you know, a Toyota Supra or, a, you know, or, or a Corvette or a Ferrari. Uh, it just means that that's not for them, right? So we've got those things in our lives and, and then we put it on ourselves. So I love Cooley's quote because I am who I think you think I am, right? Mm -hmm. And when, when you really put it into that perspective, all of a sudden you think about that and you go, what the F mm -hmm. have I been doing? And why have I been putting myself in this, in this corner? You know, the old, uh, what, what was it? Dirty dancing, don't put baby in a corner. We're yeah. putting ourselves in the corner. We're yeah. baby and we put baby in the corner. Uh, you know, so... From that perspective, um, you know, it really comes down to a lot, you know, a, a lot of noise that we need to be a little more pragmatic in our decision making. So you asked a question and I and I've and I've missed a word throughout this whole thing. And the word is awareness. I think that's the number one element to, to static is just knowing that it's out there and knowing the different elements. So in the book, I go through uh, the chapters. And, you know, it's how our brain works. And then it starts out with people, right? It's parents, siblings, friends and coworkers, lovers, society. 
Then it goes into institutional. So we've been talking a lot about media, social media, marketing, right? But even our parents, now here, here's where this plays in. We've got, you know, you're raised, you're from a good family. Let's, you know, I, I know there's people that unfortunately were, were raised in, in some pretty adverse conditions, but let's even take somebody from a good family, right? The old uh, American dream, the house with the white picket fence, two and one third kids and, and a dog, right? Um, even in that scenario where the parents love you to the, to the depths of the abyss, right? When that parent gives you advice, they're doing it out of love and protection. Those are the two primary things that a parent works off of, love and protection. However, their advice is very likely very wrong for you. And the reason is their advice is through their lens and through their experiences. Now, a simple thing like, yeah, don't touch the, 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 hot, uh, the hot pot on the stove. Okay, yeah, it, it's pretty simple. But, you know, whether you should pursue a particular career, or a particular romantic relationship, or go to a particular university uh, or graduate school, you know, you pursue a medical degree or, or a law degree. Whether their advice is positive or negative, it's seen through their lens. So great example of this is somebody that wants to be entrepreneurial, wants to put all of their, you know, all their eggs in one basket to, to pursue an entrepreneurial career. However, their grandparents went through the Great Depression and really instilled on their parents, on their mother, get a good corporate job with a solid blue chip company that could provide a great pension. And if you can't do that, work for the government, uh, you know, be, be a postman, be a, you know, serve in some capacity in government. So that way, you know that you're secure for the rest of your life. Why? Because their parents or friends of theirs lost everything in the Great Depression, right? So now they're stifling you from pursuing this entrepreneurial career. Now, does it mean it stops you? No, maybe not. Maybe you're a little more rebellious. But do you pause? Likely, yes. Likely, yes. You let that static enter your brain. And maybe instead of taking advantage of that opportunity today, you waited a year or two or three. You pursued other things and realized this is just not me. Now, some people, it stops completely. They don't pursue their dreams, their goals, their purpose, just because of a parent or a friend's advice. Uh, you know, so that's static too. So we just have to know that when we're getting advice, whether it's asked for, which by the way, when we ask for advice, you know, let's be real with ourselves. We're really asking for validation. We don't often want to hear the opposite, you know, the opposition. We, we want to be validated so that way we could justify the decision that we had already predetermined in our head we were going to make. Um, that said, though, we get a lot of unsolicited advice. And, you know, let's let's take one more scenario. Is uh, so, you know, before you were married, you know, you're out, you've got some guy friends, you're all hanging out, you meet a girl, you start dating her, it's a couple months in and for you, like, Beautiful girl, great personality, but it's just not, it's just not meshing. It's not you, it's not her, it's just you and her together. It's, it's, it's oil and water, both great products, <laughs> just not together, right? And your friend says, Jeff, dude, Angela's amazing. Like, don't, like, I know you're talking about breaking up with her. Don't, man, don't. She's amazing. You're not going to get another girl like that. And you think, man, my friend really cares about me. Meanwhile, he's a good friend. He really does care about you. He'd help you out with a flat at three in the morning or bail you out of jail if you, if you got into jail. But when it comes to Angela, she has a girlfriend, Stacy, and your friend really has the hots for her and knows that that ship will absolutely, if he has any chance at all with her now, he definitely won't if you and Angela break up. So is there ulterior motive in what people are saying? You know, again, where does this static lie? But it goes deep. So just being aware of why people are telling you what they're telling you, that they have their own lens, that they have their own experiences and they may not apply to ours, gives us the ability to sift through and pick the pieces of what we really need to impact our lives in a, in a more sensible, 
approachable and uh, and best best practices way for our decisions and following our core purpose. It's been great, dude. I mean, there's a lot to unpack. Um, <laughs> first of all, um, when when uh, my wife hates that I like to always dress casual, so when she tells me I have to wear a certain jacket. Uh, I have to wear the certain jacket and she's like, you can't wear that. You can't wear a hat to this event. I'm like, babe, come on. Um, <laughs> in, in that case, I'm following orders. Yeah. That, that's a little different than <laughs> the static I'm talking about. <laughs> I love it, dude. So uh, uh, this is, this is an awesome conversation. And I think something that impacts all of us, I, I guarantee it this, this impacts everyone. Um, uh, so this book is, is probably going to be something that a lot of, a lot of our listeners are probably going to want to get their hands on. So how do they, how do they find this book? Where, where can they get it? Pretty easy. Just amazon.com. It's, uh, I don't have it in audio yet, but I am working on that. So we'll have audio for those. Cause I'm an audible person. I, um, I'm not a, a handheld book like this often. I've read a few, but, uh, but most of the time it's at the gym or in the car on audio. So I will have that soon. But for those that do read, uh, it's available in, in this one right here, paperback, uh, hardcover, as well as uh, Kindle version. So uh, just just go ahead and go on to Amazon, type in static Alex Rivlin, because if you just type in static, it'll be somewhere down there, but you're going to get like static guard and static cling stuff and, and a bunch of other, you know, static reducing the thing that you can plug into your TV or radio. Like, yeah, so static Alex Rivlin, and it'll pop you right to it. And if somebody wanted to connect with you, what's the best way to do so? Uh, just find me either on Facebook or Instagram and DM me and happy to have a chat. I love it, man. Uh, this this is a conversation that I feel like is, uh, it's e even though this is super relevant and has been super relevant, I don't feel like it's talked about enough. And I think this is going to become a conversation that becomes a lot more relevant over the coming years. Um, I mean, hell, they, they've even... There's a there's a new social app called Be Real, and and part of it is is to quote unquote I mean avoid the static, you know I mean that's kind of why it was designed. So uh, it's interesting to see how the world's going to evolve. But starting with what you see in the mirror every day, I think is 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 where it starts and and where it's ultimately going to 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 end as well. So Alex, it's been awesome, dude. It's great to catch up with you. It's great to get your insight. I'm glad you wrote this book. It's it's much needed for the for the world, not just the industry. And uh, I, I'm I'm excited. Uh, I'm gonna have to get a copy for myself as well. Uh, so we'll talk offline for that for that buddy. Sounds great. Thanks, Thanks so brother. Appreciate you, man. Lab Coat Agents Podcast.